I invite you to open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 10. Redemption through power. You have heard of the suffering of the Lord's servant. Of the condescension of the second person of the Godhead. And you will hear the deliverance promised to those who trust in the Lord. Jesus, very God of very God, condescended himself to suffer for you and for me. He concealed himself as a baby, the son of a carpenter. In taking your sin, he was defeated, humiliated, killed, and buried. Just think about that. In many churches around the globe today, they will celebrate Palm Sunday. That joyful, that triumphant entry into Jerusalem. When Jesus comes riding on a donkey. One that had never been ridden. The people are throwing down palm branches. Shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In one of the Gospels, Jesus is told to let the folks know to keep silent. And he simply responds, if they keep silent, the rocks and the trees will cry out. This Jesus who came in the incarnation silently declared only to a few shepherds at his birth. This Jesus who was not born in a palace, not even born in the in, but in a barn, and laid in the feeding trough, concealed the very identity of God. And throughout the Gospels, we hear him say, particularly in the Gospel of John, my time is not yet come. My time is not yet come. But when the time was come, He declared himself boldly, not in hints, but boldly. Five points. Israel's enemy concealed. Israel's enemy defeated. Israel's enemy humiliated. Israel's enemy killed. Israel's enemy buried. Joshua chapter 10. Verses 16 through 19. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Machadah. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hid in the cave at Machadah. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it for to keep them. And stay ye not, but pursue other your enemies, and smite the hindmost of them. Suffer them not to enter into their cities, for the Lord your God hath delivered them into your hand. As we go to the Lord in prayer, consider how the Lord delivers your enemy into your hand. Lord Jesus, we bow before you. We thank you for your goodness for your grace, for your mercy. Lord, we thank you that you are, are our conquering king. We thank you that you conquered sin and death. We thank you that you give life and peace.
Lord, we thank you that these events that we read of in Joshua are not mere moments in time. but they point forward to your identity, to your mission, to your person. Lord, make us to know your person. Reveal to us more of your identity and embolden us to be about your mission. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Israel's enemy concealed. Thus far we've seen Jericho defeated, Ai defeated, the Gibeonites deceiving Israel. Now these five kings that we saw last week that form an alliance, not only against Israel, but against the Gibeonites. These five kings doubled down in their rebellion. These kings were given 420 years to turn to God. But rather than turn, they choose their sin. They seek their sin. They seek the, the solitude of their own sin rather than solitude in the Savior. God and the news of his work had reached the ears and the hearts of these kings. They knew how God had brought Israel through the Red Sea. They knew that God not only brought Israel through the Red Sea for Israel's sake, but to, but to demonstrate his redemption through power. And they still do not repent. They've heard of Rahab. They remember Rahab. Rahab had the same information that these five kings had. But Rahab's response was different. Rahab says that her people were fearful of Israel. But Rahab hides the spies. Rahab was a harlot, a prostitute, a woman of the night. Rahab was a person with a shady past. Surely, God wouldn't use somebody like that. But if she believed in the God of Israel, then anyone can believe. These kings, they rejected mercy, and judgment came upon them. Turn with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we'll begin with those well-known words. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him should not perish, but have everlasting life, continuing. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. 
He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Look at verse 18 again. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. What an indictment. These five kings, they reject God's mercy, they re and they receive God's judgment. If they had believed, they would not be condemned. But because they did not believe, they are condemned already. There are folks all around you and me who do not believe They're not awaiting condemnation. Condemnation is, is not something that they see after they die when they face hell. They are condemned already. The stamp of condemnation is on their foreheads because they believe not. Israel's enemy concealed themselves in a cave, hiding from the wrath and judgment of God. Israel's enemy would soon find themselves defeated. Verses 20 and 21. Back to Joshua chapter 10, verses 10, 20 and 21. And it came to pass when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them, with a very great slaughter, till they were consumed, that the rest which remained to them entered in defensed cities. And all the people returned to the camp to Joshua at Makedah in peace. None moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. God gave his people, the victory. And it wasn't a small victory. It wasn't, it wasn't like Israel 12, these five city-states, 11. It was a great victory for God and for Israel. And those who remained went back to their fenced Cities in defeat. As we work through these points, concealing, defeating, humiliating, killing, and burying, I want you to think about that which Christ faced for you and for me. You and me were enemies of God. You and me were aliens and strangers to the covenants and promises. You and me were without hope and without God in the world. But God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while you and me were yet sinners, Christ. Jesus became God's enemy on your behalf. As God's enemy on your behalf, he concealed his identity until the time was right. And each step in his life showed 
a resounding message as to his identity, his person, and his mission. He was born and visited by mere shepherds. Two years later, he's visited by wise men, Gentiles, who bring great gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We hear nothing about him until age 12. When he's taken to the temple for the feast, he stays back. And Mary says, why did you worry your father and I? And what was Jesus' response? Jesus didn't, didn't hint at his identity and his response. He was bold. He was loud and clear. When Mary says, your father and I were worried, his response is, didn't you know that I'd be about my father's business? Jesus knew his identity. He knew who his father was. And then at the cross, when Jesus became God's enemy on your behalf, he was defeated. He faced defeat for you and me. When he allowed himself to be betrayed by one of his own. When he allowed a mock trial to indict him. When he allowed soldiers to beat him, pluck his beard, pluck his hair, strike him with a cat of nine tails, force him to carry his own cross, and then nail him to that cross. Not only did Jesus, as God's enemy on your behalf, conceal himself, not only did he face defeat for you, but Jesus, as God's enemy, faced humiliation. Verses 22 through 24. Then said Joshua, Open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so. And brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass, when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel, and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. The very kings who were the objects of Israel's fear 40 years prior now are humiliated. 40 years prior, Joshua, Caleb, and 10 other spies go into the land. They come out with grapes carried by two men on their shoulders. They come out sharing how prosperous the land is, how the land flows with milk and honey. But ten of the spies say, but wait. The land is good. It's everything God promised. But the people are giants and we are grasshoppers. Those ten spies incited fear in Israel of the kings that now Israel's captains have on the ground with their feet on their necks. These five kings concealed themselves. These five kings face defeat, and now these five kings are facing humiliation before the very folks that just five years 
prior. We're fearful of them. Joshua did this to strengthen the hearts of the people. Joshua knew of the fickleness of Israel's heart. Joshua knew that Israel would waver in their faith and in their following of the Lord God. And so he did this very thing. Almost as an ordinance, almost as a sacrament. To strengthen the hearts of the people. A World War, a World War I hero who captured more German prisoners than anyone else was once asked how he felt when he brought those enemy soldiers back to his base. His response was, I was scared to death. The Israelites, too, were scared, but God encouraged them. I mean, how would you feel if the enemy that wrought fear and trepidation 40 years prior was now brought into your very camp? You would be scared to death, but God encouraged them by leading Joshua put them on the ground, and for the captains to place their feet on their necks. In ancient times, that was a sign of victory for your enemy to be under your feet. Fast forward to Jesus. Jesus was humiliated. There's nothing more humiliating than to be spit upon. There's nothing more humiliating than to have your beard plucked from your face. There's nothing more humiliating than for an innocent man to be beaten. There's nothing more humiliating than for an innocent man to be sentenced to death and forced to carry his own cross. And that night before all of that happened, Jesus showed his humanity. Did he not? When he prayed and he sweat drops of blood, saying, Father, if there be any other way that we can do this, then please take this cup from me. But, nevertheless... Not as I will, but as you will. Remember, Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. He experienced the fear. He experienced the dread. He experienced everything that you and me experience. And God gave him the encouragement he needed to face the enemy of sin and death. Joshua hung those shameful kings on five trees. Joshua hung Shameful kings on five trees. Going back to verse 24, And it came to pass when they brought out these kings unto Joshua, and Joshua called for all the men of Israel, and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near, and they put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And afterward J Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. 
and they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. Joshua smote them, just as Jesus was smote thousands of years later. Joshua killed them, just as Jesus was killed thousands of years later. Joshua hung those shameful kings, those five shameful kings on five trees, just as Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, would be hung on a tree, shamed, just like those five kings, but different. Those five kings were shamed because of their wickedness, because of their debauchery, because of their rebellion, because in the face of God's judgment, they chose rather to ignore His mercy. Jesus, though, faced shame and was killed not because of his own sin, not because of his own rebellion, not because of his own debauchery, but because of your sin, your rebellion, your debauchery. Those five kings, like the two thieves on either side of Jesus, deserved what they got. Jesus was smote. He was hung on a tree. He was killed for you. Jesus became God's enemy, concealing his identity, facing defeat, humiliated, and killed for your sin, for your rebellion, to make you right with God. And then Israel's enemy buried. Verse 27. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun, that Joshua commanded, and they took them down off the trees and cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain until this very day. We know that they could not have left those five kings overnight. Thousands of years later, not only could they not leave Jesus' body on the cross overnight, but they couldn't leave it on a feast day. He's removed from the cross. He's placed in a cave with a stone rolled in front of it. Let me remind you, Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Verses 22 and 23. Deuteronomy, 22 and 23. Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed, of God, that thy land may be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Then Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Verses 10 through 14. For as many as are of the works of the law 
are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You and me were enemies of God. But Jesus became God's enemy in your place. He concealed his identity. He concealed his person. He concealed his mission until the time was at hand. And at that right time, not a moment too soon, not a moment too late, Jesus faced defeat. Sin, death, Satan held their feet on Jesus' neck, humiliating Jesus as God's enemy on your behalf, killing him and burying him. But the difference is, look back there at the end of verse 27 in Joshua chapter 10. Speaking of those five kings being buried in the cave in which they hid themselves originally, which remain until this very day. What's the difference between Jesus and these five shameful kings? Jesus does not remain in that tomb, for up from the grave he arose, joyful and triumphant, or his foes. What will you do with Jesus today? Will you leave him as only a Sunday morning thing? Will you leave him as only somebody that you, that, that, that you remember by having a cross around your neck or on your lapel or on your tie? Will he be only somebody that you sing of from time to time in worship? But it doesn't affect the rest of your life. Will you leave him on that cross? Will you leave him in that grave? Or do you serve a risen Savior? What will you do with Jesus tomorrow when you encounter someone in the streets? What will you do with Jesus tomorrow when you're at the supermarket? What will you do with Jesus tomorrow when you are at work? What will you do with Jesus when you interact with those who don't know him tomorrow? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you. We thank you for who you are and what you do in us and for us and through us. Lord, you've called us to action. May we be obedient to your call. It's in your name we pray. Amen.